Welcome back to High Impact Growth. I'm Amy Vaccaro. In today's episode, we're continuing to unpack Demangi's second strategic priority for the next five years, which is to sustain exponential growth. One of the key ways we're approaching this is by investing in partner ecosystems, which means helping developers and local implementers build content and applications specific to their needs with ComCare. First, let's hear from Jonathan Jackson, Demangi CEO, who shares that this isn't the first time we've tried to do this. How are you thinking about building the local partner ecosystem today? So, you know, this is something that was always a passion of ours. We, we 10 years ago, tried to get an initiative called Code in Country up off the ground, supporting partnerships with local developers in country. And we failed to get that off the ground because we kept um, having to trade off speed versus cost and effort to do capacity building. And so this time around, we're really trying to be much more cognizant of recognizing that that trade off is still going to be there. So what needs to be true? to support third parties to implement without us or to support third parties to implement with us, but then take over on behalf of a client or to just support the client to build themselves directly. So we've invested a ton over the last couple of years in our technical documentation capabilities for our application builder and our ability for um, people to self-host. And we're in fact doing an update to our Tamaki Academy, which should make the content more accessible and uh, the courses more enjoyable to leverage. But really looking at, you know, can we shorten the amount of effort and time that goes into capacity building so people can build faster in ComCare? But then also, can we enable more valuable features of the platform to be uh, more accessible? And so a lot of our partners are actually doing a lot around learning right now. So they're using ComCare as an e-learning platform. That's not a use case that would be obvious to you if you were looking at our website or just using the platform. But all the core capabilities are there in our platform. And so for those common use cases that we're trying to enable or seeing our ecosystem doing on their own, how do we surface those and provide guidebooks or cookbooks on how to do that on their own? So when we think about exponential growth, it's not just at the software layer, although that's been our biggest success to date. It's much more also at the content and the communities of practice and the best practices and the enablement. And that's what we're really excited to be focused on as well in 2022. There are many people at Demagi working on building out our partner ecosystem. For today's episode, Jonathan and I spoke with Rowena Luke. Rowena Luke, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today. So you are Chief Connector at Demagi. You are also host of the Aid Evolved podcast, which I have to say was an inspiration for this podcast. So thank you for blazing that trail. And you're one of the earliest Demagi team members. So before we jump into exponential growth talk, I wanted to ask you a bit about your story and how you came to Demagi, why you joined, how did that happen? It's a pleasure to be here, Amy. Thanks for inviting me on the show. So my story with digital health, I think begins when I was in graduate school. You know, I finished engineering, figured I'd go work at a Google or a Facebook or something. And then I was, you know, in graduate school, just getting ready for all of that. And I'd always been interested in doing something good for the world, like working with Amnesty and organizations like that. And in graduate school, I I discovered there was a research group called Technology and Infrastructure for Emerging Regions. And I'd never heard of this before. And as someone who's really passionate about technology and wants to do some good in the world, I was like, oh, this is insane. Like the idea that I can use technology and do some good, like that's that's really intriguing. So I, I followed the team members around until they, they let me join their, their project and brought me to Ghana. It was in Ghana that I, the very first person I met, uh, you know, actually at the airport was Dr. Silva Vortia. He's a Ghanaian physician who also does a bunch of programming in his closet. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, I'm an engineer, like, I don't know what I can do with those skills, you know, let's let the doctors do their doctor things. But he, as a doctor, was the first one that said to me, Ghana needs more technology. Ghana needs to be doing things better and faster and differently than before. And it was because of those words of encouragement for him that I was like, okay, like, yeah, I think, I think this is a career for me. Fast forward a few years, I was roaming around in Canada. I was trying to set up a nonprofit uh, to do telemedicine work in West Africa, not doing a terrible job of it, to be honest. And as I was applying for a grant, I started chatting with this fellow named Neil Lesh, 
whom you might be familiar with. And Neil was like, oh, yeah, you know, this is, this is a really interesting idea that you have. Have you, have you heard of Demagi and what they're doing? This was 2008. And I looked over and I was like, wow, these guys, they're doing exactly what Ghana needs. They're doing exactly what we need in West Africa. And they're way ahead of me. I need to close up shop and join what they're doing. So that's how I joined Demagi back in 2009. So, Ro, in the first couple episodes, we were asking about the founding story of Demagi, and we hear a lot of male voices. I'm wondering, were you one of the first female hires at Demagi? I don't know if I was the first female hire at Demagi, but I think I was the first female hire that stuck. I remember joining the organization and walking into this room full of all these hardworking MIT guys. It was a pretty busy time, so everyone would eat lunch at their desk. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I would love to have lunch with this group of people. But because I was the only woman, I just, you know, I didn't want to be that woman who's approaching all these guys. So I just sat quietly at my desk. And, you know, not too long after that, Danny Roberts joined the company. And he wasn't afraid to be weird or different. And he would just walk up to these guys who were clearly busy and say, hey, let's have lunch. And he's a big part of how Demagi got to the amazing culture that it has today. I think if I had it all to do over again, I wouldn't be afraid of being weird or different or the only girl in the room. I would just worry about being me. Yeah, I'd say Ro was one of the early cultural leaders we had here at the organization in our Boston office. And that time period for the company back in 2009, 2010 was a really fun period where we had a lot of young engineers joining the organization, some like Rowena with their masters and a few with their PhDs, but it was really, you know, an engineering heavy team at the time. And I think Ro was certainly the first female engineer that, that stuck at the company. We had a high turnover rate in our first group of engineers, both male and female, until we kind of hit our stride on exactly, you know, what we were looking for and, and what people wanted to see in us. Um, and, and that started right around the time when Ro joined. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ro, for, for leading that charge. And, you know, I think that the organization has really evolved a lot um, since then. Ro, you recently took, I'm not sure if you would call it a sabbatical or sort of took a break from Demagi and then decided to come back. What did you do in your sabbatical and, and what, what brought you back here? Oh, that's a great question. I think I went on sabbatical because at that point I'd been with Demagi 12 years, which is a long enough time for anyone to be in any organization. And I just wanted to take a breath and have a broader look at what was going on in the ecosystem. You know, I spent 10 years very much heads down, like, let's get this company off the ground. Let's grow. Let's deliver the project. Let's deliver impact. And I felt like I was missing the perspective of what's going on with the rest of the world. <laughs> What's, you know, what's going on with, with technology in Africa? Um, so when I was on sabbatical, that's when I launched the podcast, Aid Evolved. And I took that opportunity to speak with a bunch of the folks that are working in, in the nonprofit space and the digital health space. And then also to reach out to technologists, founders, and leaders in Africa that are doing really interesting work, changing the game and starting organizations in Africa. And I, I really valued that experience, uh, continue to value that experience. And in a funny way, it's also what, what brought me back, because I remember chatting with John about, OK, you know, I've, I've gotten my break. I have my energy back. You know, what's next? And John asked me, well, what are you passionate about? What's going to motivate you? And I, and I told him in this conversation, I was like, well, John, here's the thing. I am really interested in building out the technology ecosystem in Africa, and I think it's a direct competition to what Demagi does. And John said, I think that would be super high impact. Let's do that. Yeah, and I, I think when Rowena started the Eight of All podcast, I was an avid listener to it, and I was fortunate that she had me on. But I think that outside learning is always something, Ro, you've, you've sought for Demagi to be better at I and mean, try to you know not just focus on our organization as the main project, but how do we fit into the broader ecosystem. And it's really hard to do that when you know our margins are so thin and growing is so hard. And so it's something that I am excited that we finally have the opportunity and the bandwidth and the team size that we can really invest. And it's been something you and I talked about for many years, you know, with different partnerships and opportunities. And this is something that I'm, I'm really excited to see what we can do now in this new phase. I really like that story, Ro, because I think it speaks to a theme I've seen across folks at Demagi where people change roles over the years as their interests and their passions evolve. And I think it's it's just a really 
impressive thing that Demagi is able to be flexible enough to allow folks to explore passions within Demagi, as well as let them step away and come back, right, which you've done. When I, when I joined, I figured I'd be around for two years and then go on and do the next thing because I have a very short attention span. But, you know, one thing led to the next, and now it's been like 14 years. Wow. That's really impressive. So for this episode, we're, we're really digging in on strategic priority number two in Demagi's five-year strategy document that we just laid out. That priority is sustain exponential growth. And as I was reading through it, one of the pieces that is really weaved throughout that strategy is considerations around our ecosystem, enabling other organizations to really build with calm care. That's at the heart of your role, right? And that's at the heart of what's brought you back to Demagi. Why, why this strategy now? And I think I guess I'm asking that because it sounds like John, what you shared with me is that this is a strategy we've we've considered before. Um, it maybe didn't go as we thought it would. Why are we recommitting to this now? I believe now is the best time to build on this. When Demagi was a smaller organization, you know, before we demonstrated profitability, when we were just trying to cover our costs and not lay off our staff, we really needed to look more short term. You know, the deals in front of you, like how do you close it? How do you move it forward? While still delivering impact, but more short sighted. I think with where the organization is now, we can expand the work that we're doing and we can look a little bit more longer term. Demagi has always been very strong on the partnership side. Like, you know, our work involves partnering with governments, nonprofits, and research institutions. Now we're in a space where we're building out new kinds of partnerships where we need to very carefully craft the value proposition so that we're creating value on, on all sides of the table with the local technology ecosystems, or with other players, be they universities or content, uh, content experts, subject matter experts, or other technology players. And at this point, we have the mind share, we have the market share, and we have an understanding of what's going on in these industries enough that we can intentionally craft that value proposition. And we can take the time to build the partnerships. You know, like any relationship, partnerships take time to build. And I think we didn't have the luxury to invest as much in it in the past as we might have wanted to. From my perspective, it was really exciting when Ro came to me and said, you know, that she was excited about building the tech ecosystem in Africa. I think we're at a position and our flywheel is kind of working fast enough that if it ends up being competitive to what Ro originally talked with me about, that's going to be okay. And that'll be a good thing for us to learn. And if we contribute to accelerating the ecosystem, even if it doesn't benefit Comcare, we're now fortunately in a position as an organization to do that. But more importantly, I think we're finally at a place where it's win-win. The amount of demand we're seeing for Comcare, the amount of emphasis on local ecosystem development, local technology vendors, and the, the financial funding for that, I think is making it a good business value for them. But most importantly, I think the innovations on top of Comcare are gonna come from local partners. They're gonna have the best understanding of the market, the best understanding of how to potentially use Comcare and when not to use Comcare. You know, when, when we're selling Comcare, obviously everything looks like it needs Comcare, but it can be really helpful to have partners who it's one of several tools they offer and can really make the best option for what their partners need. Yeah, we're just in a better place to be able to think longer term. So can you tell me, Rowena, like what is this partnership program looking like? How is it taking shape and, and how are you thinking about building it? I think what makes it so interesting and what I really love about this work is that there are so many different kinds of players out there. Let me let me give a few examples just of, of how it's it's coming together. And, and I think the key here is recognizing one that one that we the, value, the the product that we provide and the platform and the infrastructure that we give can enrich the work of other players out there. And also recognizing that there are ways and opportunities in which other actors in these ecosystems can really create impact or create value in a way that Demagi can't. So there's a certain amount of understanding that shared value as well as amount of humility and understanding our place in the market. So let me give you a few examples. So one of our one of our partners is Instrat in Nigeria. They're a local digital health organization. When COVID-19 broke in 2020, They were able to respond within 24 hours and deploy a COVID-19 application on Comcare in Nigeria that was announced by the Ogun State's commissioner. And that's just, we don't even have staff in Nigeria right now. Like, it was amazing that they could move that quickly. And that's not something that we would have been able to do. 
Another one I'll highlight is the story of Ag Impact, or now Oikoi, in Australia. Stuart grew up, uh, he spent his whole life as a, as a farmer, growing cotton and sorghum and a few other commodities. And then he actually found ComCare independently. He was doing research to figure out like what was the best tool for managing the agricultural value chain. And he found ComCare, selected it from a suite of other tools, and then used it for his work. And because of Stuart, ComCare is now being used to manage the value chain of the largest buyer of cinnamon in Indonesia. And I don't know if you know this, but 60% of the world's cinnamon comes from Indonesia, and 90% of that comes from Sumatra, the island where Stuart works. I'm certainly not an expert on cinnamon. <laughs> I don't think I personally would have ever been able to build up that particular app. But to me, I just, I just find it crazy and amazing that someone like Stuart could get a tool like ComCare and make it do all these things in geographies, around use cases that we might not have even imagined when we created the platform. And th I think those are examples of the kind of creativity, the kinds of innovation that we can unlock as we build out this partnerships ecosystem. So Rowena, I wanted to ask about competition, right? So if you think about these local technology providers, you might think that they are, they're actually competing with what Demagi does and what ComCare offers. But you're saying it's not competitive. Why, why is that? So many answers to that question. And Amy, it's, it's a really good question. On, on the one hand, there's the piece that John has already spoken to about how we're targeting high impact exponential growth. And our vision for the future is one in which there's so much demand in so many different corners of this landscape that we want as many players in there as possible to create value using these open source products that we're offering. I think the other piece that's worth being mindful of is is the role that ComCare as a platform plays in the ecosystem. I think of ComCare as infrastructure. You know, ComCare isn't, it's not a single application that we're selling because if it were a final application, then we would be competing directly against you know, other mobile apps that are out there. ComCare is a solution for building mobile solutions. It's, it's infrastructure. And infrastructure is something that open source software is very well suited for matching. Like if you look at, if you look at the GitHub state of open source, the open source projects that are most successful are the ones that are creating that, that heart, that backbone. But the point of infrastructure is to build on top of it. And so the reason that we need these local technology players, you know, local universities, local content experts, is so that we can really use this infrastructure to allow communities to help themselves. The hubris of aid is believing that we can help people better than they can help themselves. And that's not a mistake that we're making. There are people in these communities that understand agriculture, that understand finance, that understand health and malaria and HIV so much better than we do and can speak to the communities we serve so much better than we can. And being able to open up this ecosystem of partners is how we unlock the potential for these communities to lift themselves out of poverty. Wow, Rowena, I think that's so, so powerful. And I almost want to stop there and have you repeat that. Aid, <laughs> aid tends to hinge on this idea that we know what's best for someone else, right? And you're basically saying, that's not our approach. Say a little bit more about that. I'd love to unpack that with you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think there's, there's no shortage of the debate right now on decolonizing aid and the inherently paternalistic side of aid. You know, why do we have all these white people from the Western world coming in to tell people how to make their own lives better. Demagi from day one has adopted this design under the mango tree approach. Uh, and it's really important that that same kind of philosophy permeates itself into our strategy, into our long-term vision. Even as we grow, we become mature, we become the organization that we are today. And the way that we are looking now at taking this, this ability to create meaningful and powerful calm care apps and opening that up to the broader ecosystem is has incredible leverage. And I think it's a particularly powerful move because, you know, John, here, here we out, because doing that kind of content creation on the platform has historically been such a major revenue driver for Demagi. But the point of Demagi, the reason it exists is not to create revenue. The point is to create impact. And because of that, we're opening up this ecosystem of content creation to a broader variety of players and partners out there. Absolutely, Ro. And, you know, this has been something that we've tried multiple times to, to figure out ecosystem approaches that could work for us because we've always believed that communities have the answers and that we could be you know, great at providing the digital infrastructure, but the solution itself would always be locally driven. And this is um, 
you know, we're fortunate to be in a position now with our aggressive growth over the last couple of years and our success to really be able to invest and, and crack this. And I'm super excited to see what we can do. Or any final words either of you want to add? I think the other thing that makes this, this cause particularly relevant for me as well as, you know, now that I live in South Africa, both my children were born here in South Africa. It has a certain personal significance that we're able to tap into talent on this continent in a way that we haven't before. That's our show for today. Before I close, I want to share some of my takeaways. Today's conversation really underscored for me just how essential our partner ecosystem is to high impact growth. By seeing Damagi's role as an open source infrastructure provider, we show respect for the communities who truly know what's best for them better than we can. Rowena touches on what she calls the hubris of aid which is that white Western cultures know what's best for communities in need around the world. And that simply isn't true. Damagi's role and point of view on decolonizing aid will certainly come up in future podcast conversations, but our investment in our partners today is one way that we are unlocking the potential for communities to lift themselves out of poverty. And also as someone who joined Damagi About a year ago, I'm really grateful to be joining when we're in a position to be thinking long-term. We've always known partners were important, but we haven't always had the luxury to have staff focused on them. Lastly, I wanna thank Rowena for blazing a path for Damagi in many ways. As one of the first female hires who stuck, as an advocate for our partner program, and as creator of the Aid Evolved podcast, which I highly recommend. So on the next episode, you're going to hear from Dave Moray, Senior Director of Product, about how we think about building ComCare's capabilities and functionality to support exponential growth. Thanks for joining.